big problem for, for me and uh, for anyone doing pediatric ophthalmology is residual accommodative esotropia. When I started uh, practice after fellowship in, in 1980 and 81, uh, it, uh, there were a lot of congenital infantile esotropes. We saw a lot of them, probably at least 30 or 40 percent. Now they're very rare for reasons we don't understand, but accommodative esotropia, residual accommodative esotropia is much more common. So this is a common problem. I have no conflict of interest. Uh, obviously, the <coughs> everyone knows that refractive accommodative esotropia is esotropia in early childhood, usually not in the first six months, although it can be. Typically, between six months and three or four years of age is the onset. It's associated with high hyperopia, usually more than three diopters, although it can be less. And we treat it with glasses to correct the full refractive <coughs> hyperopic refractive error. And if the full hypermetropic correction, plus or minus bifocals, if there's a high C ratio, moves the patient into the monofixation range or orthophoria, plus or minus about uh, six or eight prism diopters, then we just observe the patients and follow them for development of binocular vision and, and vision in each eye. The problem patients are the partially accommodative ones. If there's a residual ET of greater than 10 prism diopters for distance or near, with or without a bifocal, which persists after wearing the full hyperopic correction, then surgery is indicated for the residual deviation. Not for the full deviation, but for the residual deviation. In terms of surgical treatment, again, in, in the United States, most of us do bilateral medial rectus weakening of some, some, some type. Uh, the controversy is in the surgical dose, though. Um, standard surgery, if we use the standard tables that were written by Parks and others over the years, uh, results in a very high uh, undercorrection rate, 62, uh, 40, uh, sorry, 42 to 65 percent in the literature. Uh, even when we use uh, the distance or the near, which is usually a larger deviation for uh, the surgical table planning. So for that reason, a number of augmented surgical techniques have been developed over the years to increase the dose or to add a Faden procedure, pulley suture, slanted recessions, etc., other procedures to try and catch these under corrections and eliminate them. And Parks added a millimeter to the recession if the medial rectus, of the medial rectus if there was a high C ratio. Ken Wright averaged the near with correction and the near without correction, or the near without correction and distance with correction if there was a high ACA ratio. And you can see from here other augmentation techniques that have been used over the years. In 1986 or 1987, I became interested in another augmentation pr uh, protocol, and uh, that's listed here. And I've been using that since the late 1980s. Uh, the, the, my uh, goal here is to base the surgical dosing on the mean or the average of the near deviation with a distance correction and the distance deviation without correction. This is the key point of this whole talk. And I've been using this since 1987. Why did I pick these numbers? As I said, most of the other augmentation techniques were arbitrary. Add a millimeter or the, you know, use different uh, combinations of, of a near distance, that kind of thing. But I think this one has real physiologic rationale. You have to correct at least the near deviation with correction, which is the largest deviation with the glasses on. Usually most of the patients have a smaller distance and a larger near deviation. Uh, you prefer a small overcorrection of, of that deviation because you can reduce the plus to treat that. If you undercorrect, you can't do anything but reoperate. Uh, <clears throat> but you can't treat more than uh, the distance correction, distance deviation without correction. Why is that? Because if you remove the glasses completely, you would still have an overcorrection. So you need to treat somewhere in between. So I selected to use an average of those two numbers, near with correction and distance without correction. Let's illustrate how that's used. <clears throat> and, and, and again, it's, this is why it's so important to measure all of your accommodative isotropes with and without correction, both at distance and near. You need all four of those numbers to plan. And again, this is a typical case, a three-year-old girl, isotropia since 18 months, vision's equal, uh, the typical you know, moderate to high hyperopia in both eyes. Uh, we treated with glasses. We had a residual esotropia, as we see here, at distance with her correction, 20 PD of esotropia at near 30 PD of esotropia. So what surgical dose? Again, using my algorithm, 
you use the mean or the average of the near with full correction and the distance without correction. So in this case, they're the same. We measured her without correction, and we choose 30 at distance and 40 at near. So our target angle is 30 PD of esotropia on the table I used from, uh, based on Marshall Park, which is published in my atlas. It's 4.5 millimeters. But let's look at the same child, and we take off the glasses, and we get very different measurements, a lot more accommodative convergence. So here, with the glasses on, again, same child. But if we take off the glasses, we get at distance without correction, 50 PD esotropia, at near 60 PD, then our target becomes, again, the average of near with correction, distance without correction, 40 prism diopters. So my surgical dose is going to be 5.5 millimeters. And these are all examples of real cases, just for, <clears throat> for illustration purposes. And again, it's the same kind of response with the glasses. This is a child who also had high ACA ratio. So we gave her a bifocal, and she still had a residual deviation. But again, in my protocol, I use the near without, uh, through the upper segment, without the bifocal. So in this case, 30 prism diopters esotropia. Without correction, she increases to 80 prism diopters of esotropia at distance. And so again, the target angle halfway between 30 and 80, 55. So I'm going to reset the medial rectus in both eyes, 6.5 millimeters. Again, the patient would look exactly the same when they walk in your office with their glasses on, but require very different doses of surgery. And again, this is physiologically based. The patients who have more accommodative convergence are going to get a larger dose of surgery, which makes sense. More recently, uh, Dr. Shawe Leo and some of my other fellows have reviewed my results with this. I've been very happy with this since the 1980s. Um, so we did a retrospective review, patients operated by me. And again, the inclusion criteria listed here, uh, residual ET at distance and near of greater than 12 prism diopters. Uh, with full hyperopic correction, surgery after six months of age, and post-op follow-up for at least six months. Uh, again, these patients had no associated palsies. A, B pattern, inferior oblique surgery, Down syndrome, developmental delay were also included because these are commonly associated with this and would uh, be important in, in the practice. We came up with 107 charts where everything was complete, operated between 1998 and 2008. Um, <coughs> And this list, this just goes through the, uh, the demographics of that patient group. Again, very typical of residual accommodative esotropes. Their hyperopia averaged 4.29, uh, plus 4.29 diopters. They 55% had no stereopsis with their glasses or without. 38% had gross and 12%, only 12% had refined. 100% had distance glasses. 35% had bifocal. We did bilateral medial rectus recession on all the patients. <coughs> uh, 4.9 millimeters was the mean amount of surgery, which really isn't that important when you look at the protocol. We super placed uh, on four patients the medial rectus for A pattern, infra placed it for V pattern, as we heard in the first talk today. 35.5% uh, had associated inferior oblique surgeries. So many of these patients have inferior oblique overaction, and I do surgery, as I mentioned earlier on these patients at the same time if I'm going to be operating on the medial rectus anyway. And again, this is the table I use from my atlas. Initial success, six to eight weeks. I don't usually see the patients back for six to eight weeks when they're fully healed, and this is without manipulation of glasses, wearing the same glasses. Uh, I used uh, as my criteria for success uh, each atropia of less than 10 prism diopters. Uh, any XT at all after glasses manipulation was considered a failure. Most patients, if you get an overcorrection, even a small one in this type of patient situation, the deviation will increase over time and it will be a, a gross failure. Uh, Bert Kushner and others have published on this as well, and I think many, many have, have seen this. So using those criteria, which are quite stringent, 95 patients or 89% were successfully treated at this first um, time point, six to eight weeks after surgery, which is, I think, all you can hope surgery can do. After that, it's kind of up to the patient's binocularity to keep the eyes straight. And the sensory outcome was also very good. 85% had improved, improvement in their binocularity. And this, uh, in, in uh, tabular form, looks at um, the result at six to eight weeks. And you can see orthotropia uh, at distance and <coughs> I'm sorry, at near, and 58%, 
and less than 10 diopters of uh, residual in 31%, and alignment at distance, 62% and 33%. So again, our success group was very, very high with this. It also, uh, you can see down here that uh, only 10% now had no stereopsis, probably from amblyopia. 17% had gross, and 72.5% had refined strabismus, with 24% showing um, biofovial 40 seconds of arc, so 85% improvement. The advantages of binocular vision, and again, that's why we're doing these surgeries at a young age, are better long-term stability of alignment. I think we all know that. Reduced risk of before and or severity of amblyopia. It improves amblyopia treatment. Patients with straight eyes do much better with amblyopia treatment. Improved achievement of motor developmental milestones, better reading ability, and improved long-term quality of life. And this was all looked at by Eileen Birch uh, a number of years ago. There was one interesting subgroup, a uh, success subgroup, and that was 18 patients, or 17%, with this augmentation had good alignment and good visual acuity at distance and near without glasses. And we don't promise patients you can remove your glasses. As a matter of fact, I usually tell them you won't be able to remove the glasses at that time. We'll talk in a minute about how I handle these patients later. I don't predict this, but again, 17%, we could remove the glasses. And again, those were the ones that were more mildly affected, as you might expect. Uh, their vision was good. Their target angle, mean target angle initially was 30 prism diopters, and they had typically a, a range of 0 0.75 to 4.25 diopters of hyperopia. Did this last? Was this a successful treatment long term? We had 88 patients that we followed up for two years. 22% um, were no glasses at that point. 46% were wearing distance glasses. 32% still had some bifocal. The alignment was quite stable. The near deviation in 90% of patients with correction was less than 10 prism diopters, and distance 92% were less than 10 prism diopters. Again, and none of them were exotropes. So a 90% success rate. <coughs> Let's look at how this compares to the literature. And this is, again, some of the studies that were present up, at, up till that time. And there were a number. These are all different augmentation techniques. Here are the target angles that people were aiming for. And again, you can see sort of the highlights here. And this is our study. Uh, again, we had the most stringent success criteria. Uh, we had the highest success rate, the lowest overcorrection rate, and the largest number of subjects. So I think uh, time has proven that this technique works very well. Very, very simple for you to apply if you're a general ophthalmologist doing esotropia surgery or a pediatric ophthalmologist. Now, what do we do with these patients in extended follow-up? And, and our goal here is to wean the plus slowly. Again, I don't promise patients they can outgrow their glasses, but up to 30 to 40, even 50% can be weaned out of glasses over time. So we reduce the plus lens until an ESO 40 is induced to try to build fusional divergence and wean the child from the glasses. We want to avoid producing a manifest esotropia and losing binocular function, so we look carefully for that. The hyperopia naturally decreases with age as well, and that helps us out. And about 50% uh, in um, one of my recent studies has ever remained uh, aligned without glasses after 16 years of age. And how do we do this functionally? We hold or use a clip-on low-power minus lens. We have minus one clip-on lenses in both eyes. We just clip it over their glasses, their current glasses, and have the child look at near and distance targets while the alignment is reassessed. We watch for development of astenopic symptoms and esotropia with these minus lenses on the glasses. If the accommodative esotropia wearing their full plus <coughs> and this clip-on lens. Um, oh, and we also don't want to uh, keep them in full plus for another reason, and, that, and there just is less amitropization when we have the patients in full plus. So we like to reduce them to a minimum as soon as we can um, because without that, you reduce their need for accommodation. I usually attempt weaning beginning about six to eight years of age, uh, and they usually obtain maximum weaning by 15 in girls and 16 in boys. So that's what I can kind of tell the parents in terms of going forward. The success in weaning for less than four diopters has been very high. For greater than four diopters, it's, you can reduce them quite a bit, but you'll never get them usually out of glasses or contacts or later on refractive surgery. And again, you measure the alignment at distance in near with this minus one clip on. If they are esophoric or have an intermittent ET of less than five prism diopters, 
For six prism diopters without loss of vision, you can reduce the plus in the glasses by one diopter. And if they have bifocals, I usually wean the bifocal first until they're out of bifocals because that would allow them to wear contact lenses later. And then we wean the distance plus. Uh, what about the patient who has decreased vision on follow-up? And this is another kind of common thing. And you have to rule out or think right away about over plus. As the patients normally lose hyperopia with age, if the glasses they're wearing become too strong, they won't wear them. They'll either take them off or they'll look over top. And I always ask the parents if they're not wearing their glasses well, are they looking over the top of the glasses? Uh, you want to recheck the vision with the minus uh, one clip-on lenses. And you also want to do a cyclopedic refraction to document that they are now over plus and you just have to reduce the strength of the glasses. So how do I manage residual accommodative esotropia? I think it's, it's at least for me, this is the mechanism. Full hyperopic correction for full, fully refractive accommodative ETs, bifocals for high ACA ratio. But those that have residual accommodative esotropia, I use this new surgical protocol for augmented surgery, which I think is very physiologic and has a target angle based on the mean deviation with distance correction and the distance deviation without correction. It restores binocular vision in 90% of patients, allows reduction or elimination of glasses or bifocals in selected cases. It's safe with a very low overcorrection rate and low reoperation rate and has greater success than any of the other published surgical procedures. And it's very, very easy to do. Thank you.